All right. Hey, tēnā koutou koutou o ka hua mahi a tāuhi a uh, not the fari wanga o a kero kiri kiri ro a tāua a ho ko Carson Zigwa puku ingoa. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to be able to present uh, at this conference here. Um, my name is Carson Zigwa, as is mentioned, and I have two roles at my university. I am a lead person for work integrated learning in science, and I, I run a work a, a work integrated learning program there. And the other half of me belongs to the Vice Chancellor's Office, that's part of the Director of Work Integrated Learning Research, uh, where I have academic oversight of the rollout of Work Integrated Learning at our university. Um, our university is something quite brave. We make Work Integrated Learning compulsory for all undergraduate students uh, across all of our curriculum, uh, and that was quite a big move for us at the time. And, and interestingly enough, that it was time during COVID, so we had some, some interesting challenges uh, at that time. Um, Joy Perkins has asked me to present uh, at this uh, conference here, and I had the pleasure of working with Joy as part of our Rutledge Handbook of Work and Graded Learning uh, internationally, uh, and she offered a, a great chapter on online placements, which is uh, uh, very topical. So uh, Harry, I was very fortunate to have Joy uh, on the staff. So a bit of an overview of what we'll talk about. Uh, we'll do a bit of a background about Work and Graded Learning, where it came from, uh, there's quite a lot of work done on defining work integrated learning, so we'll talk about that too. We'll skim across some of the theories of learning and, and the models of practice of, of work integrated learning, and then we'll focus on what some of the key things that are coming through the work integrated learning literature at the moment. So as part of the International Handbook work, what we did was we did a bit of a deep dive in the literature to see where the term work integrated learning came from and when it first appeared in the literature. And we were able to trace it back that it must have been formed in the early 1990s. I mean, we worked that out because there was a conference proceedings paper published in 1995 uh, in South Africa that quoted WASIS mission statement. And a WASIS mission statement was to be world leaders in work and graded learning by the year 2000. Uh, and that was the first discoverable use of that particular term. Now, WACE, WACE is the International Association for Work and Integrated Learning. And next week, they actually have a research symposium uh, in Sweden. They are a very active uh, bunch, and I'll talk about them a little bit more later on as well. Now, Work and Integrated Learning was regarded as an umbrella term, a, a term that, that captures a variety of different types of practices that actually have similar sort of intents, but we're using different terms to describe them. In fact, it's quite quite messy in terminologies in, in, in the field in that there are quite a few practices that are described using different terms, even though the practice is the same. And likewise, the same term is used to describe different practices as well. So it, it's a bit of it's a bit messy in that space. So having a, a, an umbrella term to capture all of these activities, any sort of educational approaches, was just a nice way of clustering these things together. The educational approach of work integrated learning, however, is not new at all. It, it's been around for a long time. The concept is far from new. Uh, cooperative education, which started in 1906 with Herman Snyder at the University of Cincinnati, um, that, that's more than 100 years ago. And he himself in his writing said that he borrowed the ideas from law studies, which means that practice existed before that already. Uh, sandwich degrees, which um, you may be more familiar with, uh, the evidence suggests that that started at around about 1840 because there was legislation that went before Parliament that mentioned sandwich degrees, which means they either were in existence by then or, or were about to be. And the modern apprenticeship model, uh, the approach that, that's used here at the moment, uh, that can be traced back all the way to Imperial Rome. So the actual idea of learning from a practitioner, practitioner in the field, uh, working alongside an authentic sort of context, is not a new concept at all. But clustering them together using the term work integrated learning, uh, that is. Now, you might be asking the question, what's the difference in work integrated learning and work-based learning? Well, depending on where you are, probably not much. Uh, there's a lot of overlap between those fields. Um, however, some countries do have a slightly different meaning for the word for the term work-based learning. For example, in New Zealand, work-based learning is a term used exclusively uh, in the vocational education sector, the, the polytechnics or the um, uh, technical institutions, but work-integrated learning as a term is largely used in the university sector. Uh, in some other countries, work-based learning and work-integrated learning would, would be pretty much synonymous. Uh, and in some other areas, you might find that work-based learning can refer to learning within the workplace, 
where it's not necessarily a student or educational institution involved. So it can have a more broader uh, meaning. So let's look talk a little bit about defining work integrated learning. What what is work integrated learning? And and this is also work that stemmed from the handbook. There's a chapter that's uh, in there that talks about defining work integrated learning. And there's work done in this space prior. And there was many descriptions, which I think is probably the best term used to describe them. Uh, many descriptions of work integrated learning, often in a particular disciplinary context or a local context, or describing the context at which the research was occurring. And these are moderately diverse in, in the terminologies they used. They tend to be quite broad, and, and many of them were very much focused on work placements rather than non-placement forms of work integrated learning. And national associations and educational institutions have also developed their own definitions, and, and these are often developed to suit their own context. Uh, educational institutions often have branded terminologies or ways of saying things that they want to incorporate into the definitions around the practice of work integrated learning. While national associations may use terms that are more common in, in their country as opposed to others. But broadly speaking, there, there are two forms of work integrated learning. It's probably easiest to see it that way. One being work placements, and uh, that is full immersion into a workplace and uh, like co-ops or practicums or internships. And the other is non-placement work integrated learning. And this is a practice where the students probably mostly based on campus, but there's an external partner involved and the work they're doing is real work. So that could be like consultancy work. Or it could be around creating a website for the organization or an investigation in, in something or other, but it's, it's mostly on campus type of an activity. So what were some of the common elements that we found in the definitions for work integrated learning? And there were things like integrating theory with practice, and that particularly around authentic practice, real practice. Uh, it is intentionally within the curriculum. Uh, that seems to be the one consistent thing that came through, that it has to be within the curriculum. Uh, authenticity of the learning experience, your learning experience needs to be real, and it needs to be meaningful as well. It needs to have a purpose of some sort. And it needs to be relevant to the student's study or career goals, and it must involve an external partner. Now, inherent within all of these uh, common elements is recipro reciprocity. Uh, and that is that every one of the stakeholders, all three of the stakeholders, have a gain out of this interaction from this relationship. Uh, the so-called win-win-win, as we, we often refer to uh, in practice. So when we formed this together as a definition, we came up with this over here. An educational approach involving three parties, the student, the educational institution, and an external stakeholder, consisting of authentic work-focused experiences as an intentional component of the curriculum. Students learn through active engagement in purposeful work tasks that enable them to integrate the theory with meaningful practice that's relevant to the student's discipline of study or professional development. Now, you might look at this and think, crikey, there, there's a lot going on in this definition. And, and you'll be right. There, there is a lot going on in this definition. In fact, there are nine elements sitting within this definition, which as definitions go, is definitely quite a, a, a complex definition. But what we wanted to do here, we wanted to make sure that the practices that were seen as work integrated learning was included, but at the same time, the practice that were not regarded as work integrated learning could be excluded as part of that as well. And that was a difficult part about creating a definition uh, of this form. Uh, this definition here is also now the definition for work integrated learning for the International Journal of Work integrated learning. Uh, the definition used in the Will Strategy for Universities Australia is it's their, their national uh, definition for work integrated learning. And there's a number of universities that have also adopted this particular definition. Now, if we look at each one of these elements, it is an educational approach. Uh, it is a designed way of, of, of enabling learning for students. Like lectures are supposed to enable learning for students, uh, interactive workshops, debates, uh, lab experimentation. All of these things are part of an educational approach or a bit educational approach and work in a graduate learning is one of these. Perhaps the most defining part or the most obvious part of the um, work in a graduate learning is the involvement of the three parties, as that's the student, the educational institution, and an external stakeholder. 
Now, just to make it a little bit confusing, every now and then, because we're good at making things confusing, every now and then, an external stakeholder can actually be the university. Now, universities are complex organizations, and they can wear multiple hats. So you can have students do an information science student, for example, doing a placement in the library, or a finance student doing a placement within the uh, central finance uh, committee uh, department. Um, so they're always, and even students, research students working alongside a researcher for a summer research scholarship or or placement of some sort. And that is when the university wears a different hat than just being an educational provider. It's consisting of authentic work focused experiences. In other words, it's real experiences as they would do in a real workplace. It's all around the authenticity of that. And it has to be part of the intentional component of the curriculum, as, as mentioned earlier. It is about student learning. Even though all of the stakeholders will have a benefit of engaging with work integrated learning, the student learning is, for the most part, central to the whole activity. But the student needs to be actively engaged in the activity. That They need to be doing things in that space. Uh, and things like, like shadowing in the workplace, which is a, a valuable learning experience without doubt, with the shadowing, there's not an active engagement in the work task itself. So act, um, shadowing is usually not seen as being work integrated learning because there's not an active participation, participation uh, as part of that. Related to the authenticity of the work is that the work has to be purposeful. Uh, it has to have a meaning. It has to have a purpose. Uh, it isn't just an activity the student does that once the activity is finished, that the purpose of that, that activity or that task or that outcome is finished. That's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be something that carries on afterwards. It is done for a reason and was needed for a reason. And it's about enabling the integration with theory, uh, with meaningful practice. It's applying what they've learned on campus in a practical context. And it is relevant to the student's discipline of study. So it has to be related to, to their study. Now, how relevant that is is often for debate. Um, if it's a professional degree, they may have accreditation requirements that act that particularly um, stipulate what the requirements are, like you would have in a, in a Bachelor of Nursing degree, for example. Uh, but in our case, in the Bachelor of Engineering, also a professional accredited degree, the requirements for work placements is down to, uh, it needs to be 800 hours, it needs to be engineering, but there's not defined any further than that. So it's often a little bit of debate about how relevant it has to be, but it has to be related to this study in a broad sense. So the, the theories that underpin this practice, there is no one theory of work integrated learning. Instead, it's built upon a number of theories of learning from the big thinkers uh, of the past. So we've got the cognitive development theory by Piaget, uh, the social culturism by Vygotsky, and later on by Wurtz and Engstrom. Um, Vygotsky's earlier work was mostly in Russian, which resulted in a bit of a delay coming into the Western world, but it's uh, widely adopted for the thinking that he was uh, he'd been able to develop. Uh, learning through experience or learning through doing, as we often say, by Dewey and Kolb. Uh, the reflective learning to enhance learning from the practice and reflective learning and reflective assessment is a common assessment form that we use within work integrated learning. The social learning theory by Bandura and the situated learning theory by Levy and Wang. Levy and Wang is very widely cited uh, in work integrated learning where we have students that engage in peripheral participation around a community of practice. And over time, the student develops from being a newcomer to becoming, as they refer to as the old timer, as they become enculturated into that workplace of practice. Now, if you look at these theories over here, you can see a bit of a common theme coming through. Uh, it is around learning through doing, but it is in a, in a social constructed place. It's, it's about uh, the social learning element, the situated learning. Element. It is about students learning in a particular context uh, as part of their, their approach. So what, what are some of these models look like in practice, or rather what are these models often called in practice? And I wanted to present both of these side by side because they show both the placement form of work in the graded learning and the non-placement forms of work in the graded learning. Now, the placement forms, again, this is the full immersion into a workplace, and often the terms used to describe them are work placements, um, co-ops, co-ops is cooperative education, which is a form of work placement, internships, practicums, field placement, apprenticeships, cadetships, uh, attachments, all of these involve students being fully immersed in a workplace. Now, often we talk about uh, proximity and authenticity as both being a sliding scale. And with work placements, the authenticity is on the high end of the scale and the proximity is also very high in the scale on the scale because they are in the work placement. 
Now, non-placement work in a graded learning can be quite diverse in practice, and, and I have multiple names used to describe that, and, and this is only a short list. I think there will be many more. Um, at our own institution, we call it work-related projects, and that might be things like student consultancies or, or community projects, uh, commissioned works, uh, entrepreneurship, startups, and enterprise, a really interesting space for universities to be active in, and I think we really should be active uh, in those areas. Uh, music students or uh, performing arts students might be doing performances. Uh, studio, city studio and creative studio are, are active um, forms of practice across the globe as well. And of course, we've got service learning too. Now, you'll see on the left there, there is a number of citations. You won't be able to read these necessarily, and that's okay. The slides will be shared later on, and you can pick your way through these. Uh, but these are references within the handbook of the 11 different models of work in a graded learning. And then you can read these later on. And of course, there's a very great chapter there by, by Perkins and Aaron that I encourage you to, uh, to read. So what is driving this development of work in a graded learning? Why, why are we seeing this develop further in higher education? And it's all to do with employability. The whole driving force around the spanning of work in a graded learning is around the expectations of employability outcomes. Governments are increasingly seeing employability outcomes as a key performance indicator of how well higher education is doing what it's supposed to be doing. And, and that makes a whole lot of sense. But when you think about it, government is by far the biggest investor in higher education. Um, and as any government would, they want to see a return on that investment, and that is economic growth. It doesn't matter what color of or what flavor of government you have at the time, whether it be left-leaning or right-leaning or conservative or, or liberal, that they are all very focused on this employability outcome side of things and the economic growth, especially, especially at the moment in the global context of an economic decline. Um, I should also mention, when government talks about employability outcomes, they're often talking about employment outcomes. Now, employment outcomes and employability outcomes they're not the same thing. You would think employability outcomes will lead to employment outcomes, uh, but government often means and talks or, or refers to it as being, sorry, they often mean employment outcomes. Uh, not surprising, many universities are developing their strategic goals around uh, their purposes, and, and this often makes mention around the community engagement and employability. Uh, I had a quick look at the Harriet Watt uh, strategic goals as, as you do, and Harriet Watt strategic goals talks about things uh, like flourishing communities and, and being connected, uh, pioneering education, um, work in a graded learning is regarded by many universities as being pioneering, even though the actual concepts behind it are, are as old as, as time may be. Uh, and similarly, in the curriculum framework, um, there's mentions around authentic assessment. Well, that, that sounds really exciting. It's very relevant to work in a great learning and co-creation and an industry and community collaboration. So in that sense, work in a great learning sits very well in what Harriet White what sees as being the direction of the future of higher education at this institution. Now, employability is also very core within uh, the research for work integrated learning, in fact, I, I don't think there's a single publication of late that's come out in the International Journal for Work Integrated Learning that doesn't at least mention employability somewhere within the paper. And I can envision that employability will, will likely remain a key driver for the expanding of work integrated learning and in similar strategies that involve outside community uh, and for the near future. Now, there's been research done that shows that students who've done work in a graded learning have an employability competitive advantage. That is, they're more likely to be employed earlier on and more likely to advance earlier on in their career as well. And often work in a graded learning is advertised as that being that having that particular advantage. But as institutions increasingly shift towards all students doing work in a graded learning, and for example, my university has made it compulsory for all undergraduate students, we need to start looking at all other benefits for work in a graded learning. Because if everyone does work in a graded learning, then the employability competitive edge is no longer a competitive edge. It's, it's actually become the norm. Now, that's a good thing. We need to encourage that. But some of the other benefits that come through is, for example, um, the professional identity development for students engaging in work in graded learning. Uh, citizenship. Citizenship is, is a great term around how the the individual as a professional fits within the wider community and the responsibilities they have as part of it. So it's professional identity, but bigger still. It also develops career self-management and with the career clarity that students get early on, it's quite possible that the, 
students will be having less um, career changes earlier on in the work uh, working life. Now they're forecasting that the students graduating at the moment will have five to 12 career changes in their working lives. And that, that's career changes, not, not, not job changes, but career changes. And they can be quite disruptive for the workplace. Not necessarily a bad thing that people shift into different areas and they can sometimes help populate that knowledge into different disciplines, but, but the disruptiveness early on can be um, a bit of a disadvantage. We also need to talk about quality for work integrated learning. Now, I, I wholeheartedly believe that all of the work integrated learning research has always been about quality practice for work integrated learning, because it's always been focused on improving students' learning, uh, improving students' program, the, the programs, the efficiencies within, and it's it's about always been about improving and lifting the quality gain. But of late, we are seeing quality come up as a term or a theme itself within the literature, and we've seen a lot of development around quality frameworks. Now, quality frameworks needs to consider all of the complex components of delivering work integrated learning. And work integrated learning is complex to deliver. It relies on many moving parts of the university and then key the external stakeholder as well. So quality frameworks look at around uh, stakeholder engagement, uh, whether that is appropriate and it's done to the level that it should be being able to maintain these relationships. It needs to consider the institutional requirements for, uh, for learning. Uh, curricular design, and particularly assessment design, is, is important within work integrated learning. And we need to be very mindful about how we support students during work integrated learning, particularly when they're on work placement and off campus, and all around developing and enhancing the student experience. And on the left, you'll see a number of uh, quality frameworks are cited. This will be listed in the reference list at the end. Um, the waste one is very interesting. It's, it's a very good, simple one that gives you a good framework. But if you want to see some really detailed thinking behind it, a, a more like a quality guide, uh, the Campbell ETL 2019 is particularly good. I've, I've enjoyed reading that a lot. Uh, Matthew Campbell had a way of getting to the point very quickly and, and really has been quite thorough uh, in his thinking in that space. <clears throat> Um, accreditation is something that's likely to come up in the near future around work integrated learning and the WACE uh, as a national as a world association uh, is looking around at, at the very least of developing certification, which is a step pretty close to reaching accreditation. I've mentioned non-placement work integrated learning. Uh, that's been very focal of late. Uh, it wasn't previously, it was largely overlooked and it was mostly uh, we were distracted by work placement forms of work integrated learning. But then, then COVID came along and all of a sudden non-placement work integrated learning was the bee's knees because that was pretty much the only thing that we could rely on when we didn't have access to the workplace. And ever since then, there's been a lot of work done in that area. The nice thing about non-placement work integrated learning is that it's more easy to scale up. Uh, and when you're expanding your work integrated offerings and you're relying on your work placement programs, um, you need to have a placement for every single student if you double the number of placement students, you need to double the number of placements and you may potentially have to double the number of employees you're interacting with. Now, if the market can set, it can cope with that and you haven't reached market saturation, then, then it's great. Then, then go nuts and, and develop a work integrated learning as a placement form. But with non-placement forms of work integrated learning, often students are engaging with an employer through group work. And all of a sudden, the number of external stakeholders you need to have involved uh, reduces, which allows for that scalability uh, of practice in that, that area. Well-being is topical across all of society at the moment, and, and I'm quite excited about that. I think we really do need to get our, our well-being uh, thinking and supporting uh, support uh, organized and, and much better functioning than what we have of, of the past. Now, higher education has additional challenges for students and their well-being. Students will be moving from a more financially secure family home environment to being more self-reliant on their own finances and probably not having much in the way of finances. And likewise, they've transitioned from a well-guided well -guided learning progress in a learning environment to being more reliant on their self-learning in order to achieve their learning. And at the same time, they've got greater responsibilities of themselves, they've got new experiences and, and, the, and the consequences associated with those as well. So those present additional challenges for higher education students. And we know that uh, from in regards to mental health, students report mental health challenges much more often than that of general population. 
Add to that further, work in a credit learning can add additional stresses to that still. So in regards to work placements, for example, uh, they'll have to go through an application process. And as part of that application process, they could potentially you know, receive a rejection one after the other. Going for a work placement may potentially result in having to move location. Uh, there'll be additional costs associated with it at times, new environments, and then the reality of doing real tasks and having a real awards or rewards, and then also the real consequences that may come through there. We need to be looking at how we can support our students who are neurodiverse and already have some challenge around physical health uh, and well-being needs. And unpaid work placements is particularly topical uh, of late, and I'm doing some of my own research in this area at the moment. Uh, and in New Zealand, just this week, there was a petition delivered to the government, to the parliament, in order to uh, to advocate for stipends for students who are unpaid placements in social work and in nursing and in teaching, which is um, quite a significant challenge in that area. My own research in this area has shown that the students who are not in uh, or in unpaid placements, they will encounter moderate to severe stress as a common occurrence, and, and they really do struggle with having to work for an unpaid um, context, and quite a few of them will have paid part-time work they have to give up at the same time, worsening that situation. So the unpaid work placement is an area where we really need to do some, give some significant attention. And RJ Will, International Journal for Work and Graded Learning, we are currently working on a special issue on well-being that will be published in early 2025. I, I do encourage you to keep an eye on that because we really do need to be supporting our students as best as we can. So from one biggie to another biggie, uh, equity, access and inclusion, uh, again, a real challenge across the whole of higher education. Uh, and there are some particular challenges for work in the graded learning as well. Probably the one that comes to mind the most is the uh, find your own work placement model. Now, finding your own work placement model is often advocated as in that's what it's like in the real world. That's what we should be encouraging our students and we should be supporting them. And, and that's, that's fine. It's an argument that makes sense. Some students will have great social capital and they can secure themselves a very good placement because maybe mum and dad are active in that area or Uncle Bob's got a job in this space and it can secure a placement for the student. And look, that, that's great. If students have that social capital, we need to encourage them to be using that to secure their own placement. But the thing is, not everybody has that level of social capital. Students who are first in family to university, uh, international students, Students from remote areas, uh, minority groups or groups that are actively discrim discriminated against, they really struggle under that model. And it's really important that universities are able to provide opportunities for these students where their own social capital are not able to secure them a placement. So with that said, it is really important that work in the graded learning is well resourced, that we've got our will coordinators, those people who are out there building relationships with employers, generating opportunities, and also building relationships uh, with our uh, students and try and match uh, these opportunities and students as best as they can. Uh, we just recently published a special issue on equity, access and inclusion for IJ Will, and we did a, a cultural perspectives one with overlaps in 2022. So it's some great literature kicking around uh, in this space. Now, you, it's hard to talk about work and graded learning without having to talk about managing risk as well. Uh, higher education institutions are inherently risk adverse, uh, very risk adverse at times. But work in a grade at learning is inherently risky. You have, particularly for work placement, you have students off campus for university, university purpose within the workplace doing real work. There's a whole lot of risks sitting around there that need to be quite carefully managed. So not all risk is, is necessarily bad. I think part of the authenticity is that there is risk sitting in there, but the institution does need to consider what is risk appetite is uh, and how well it can manage. So it's particularly important about identifying tracking risks. There might be a vetting program for the, um, sorry, a vetting process for uh, the employers and the workplaces to make sure that we are comfortable and that they are safe workplaces. Um, we, we have a process in New Zealand around every workplace is legally required to have a health and safety procedure manual. Uh, if they have that, that means they have processes in place about managing health and safety uh, in the workplace. Uh, and if they don't have one of those manuals, it quite likely means that the workplace is not compliant. So we're using that as one of the indicators about whether or not the workplace is a safe workplace uh, or not. Now, the institution may need to develop a will policy on managing work and graded learning. 
It depends a little bit on the policy structure of the institution, and, and they are quite differently structured at different institutions, and it might be that working at graded learning is already well covered with an existing policy. Um, but that is something that certainly needs to be considered. And, and my one bit of advice about managing risk within work integrated learning is that, yes, you, you need to track it and you need to do your due diligence and you need to make sure that you are doing what's required to do. Uh, but you don't want to do it in such a way that it will, uh, that it will stifle work integrated learning. If, if we make it too difficult for our external stakeholders, then, then they won't engage with that. Uh, so we need to be very careful that we find the right balance. It's very difficult to talk about risk without having to mention Craig Cameron. Kate, Craig Cameron has published extensively in this area, including in the handbook, uh, but also uh, extensively elsewhere. Uh, and he's well placed to be speaking about risk and work integrated learning. Uh, he, he runs a work placement program himself, but he's also a practice employment lawyer. All right, um, next slide. There's a fair bit of focus in the real literature around resourcing and technology. Uh, work integrated learning is complex and it's important that we have good resourcing in place. Uh, there is some research coming through in areas where work integrated learning is not so well supported that staff really struggle uh, with the workload and there's reports of, of burnout. So it's, it's important that we have the right people at the various stages involved uh, with facilitating work integrated learning. There are some platforms that are able to help with the workflow. Uh, here in New Zealand, uh, Sonia and in, in place is very common. I do believe they are both in the UK as well. Both great, great platforms. Uh, Simplicity and Orbis. Um, actually, I think Simplicity has recently bought Orbis, so that might not be the one. It's quite common in, in North America. And there's a new pro, um, new company coming out as well, such as PlaceTrack, which is a, 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 a simple version of tracking placements. And sometimes you don't need to have complex, expensive programs to do that. We also need to be looking more around simulated work placements, um, but they still need an external stakeholder. They still need some authenticity to the work. So there's some debate around that. And remote work placement. We're all doing remote work and working from home at times. We, we need to look at students doing that as part of their work placements as well as one of the models for work integrated learning. But this is definitely an area where much more research is required because technology has got so much to offer uh, and we yet to have to tap, be able to tap to the fullest extent of what we could. Now, with all this talk about using resources and, and, and the workload associated with it, it's, it's true in the sense that work integrated learning represents a significant investment in external engagement and networking. But we need to make sure that we do that investment, not just for work integrated learning, but what are some of the other things that we can lever off that? I, I'm still reminded of uh, quite some time ago, we had a groundwater hydrologist uh, in the School of Science who, who was absolutely adamant he wanted to visit a student on placement in a remote part of New Zealand, a very remote part of New Zealand. You wouldn't wouldn't go there normally. But I thought, oh, well, we'll send him on his way. We gave him a car and he, he visited the student and the student was working at a regional council. And the regional council was very keen to develop viticulture further in the area. It was a good, good location for it. But they had significant challenges around irrigation systems. And he knew enough of the geology in the area that there was large aquifers there. So he came back with two funded research projects, one for a master's and one for a PhD student to investigate the groundwater hydrology uh, in that particular area. And that's just a really good example of how funded research, externally funded research can come into the university environment by using the relationships built through work integrated learning. But some of the other things that can leave her off is an employee advisory panelship, panels, uh, sponsorship, uh, guest lectures, uh, all of these sort of things can be levered off the relationships that we build through work integrated learning. And, and likewise, data mining, we will be collecting work performance evaluations from students, uh, and that can build up to be quite a resource over time. Uh, university of Waterloo, which is a, a well-established and well-known university, they do about 35,000 work placements a year, an absolute machine. They've built up a massive amount of information around work performance evaluations, and they're currently data mining that to see what, how well students are doing in particular skills uh, in some areas, and also where the work performance evaluations are consistently saying that students are perhaps not doing so well. And that gives the university an opportunity to invest in those areas to try and lift those students up where they're not doing as well as perhaps where they should be. So it gives a lot of valuable information for curricular design. 
there is a focus again on work integration of work integrated learning across the curriculum. There was a lot of work done in the early 2000s to try and move away from the bolt on type work placements to having it better integrated into uh, the wider curriculum. Uh, just recent, this has kicked off again as a new uh, set of eyes, a new way of looking at it. And now we're looking much more at scaffolding of work integrating across all of the years and looking at a, a wider concept of employability education, which is pre-will, which is your preparation before you go into the workplace, the will activity itself, and then post-will, which is post-reflections, and then planning for the next work integrated learning opportunity. Uh, University of Wollongong has got a great structure that they're using. That's, uh, the early couple of years is not technically work integrated learning, but certainly is pre-will, but I scaffolded across four years, and I think we'll see more of that development for the next so many years. It's a good good framework and structure to use. I've got to mention work and great learning in the graduate degrees and I understand that's happening in the Harriet Watt space uh, already. Um, there is definitely a push to be uh, and more activity in that area. Um, just recently in IJ Will, there were two publications exploring that. Uh, the Australian government increasingly is requiring PhD students to do work placements as part of their PhD studies. Um, but there are some challenges around defining what work integrated learning in a graduate program would look like, because the more we go into the PhD space, the more the university seems like a natural workplace for, for such graduates, as, as one would expect. Uh, multidisciplinary practices of work integrated learning is where we have students work on a real project. And an example we have at our university is around the Sustainable Development Goals, um, where they work together as, as a diverse group of, of students. And that's to reflect that most workplaces are multidisciplinary uh, of late, or have been for quite some time. There are some challenges being multidisciplinary work integrated learning across the institution because you have to work across all of the departments and, and bring these together. And that leads me to the obvious uh, statement around sustainable development goals. These are not new, they're, they've been published seven years ago, which is quite some time ago. But increasingly, universities are mapping themselves to the sustainable development goals. And there's even ranking systems uh, around that, how the universities are ranked comparing to each other. And as universities map themselves to the sustainable development goals and workplaces do as well, then that will increasingly impact how work integrated learning looks like and how it is reported to. So where to from, from here? Um, and we need to focus and continue to focus on expanding good practice. And it's particularly important that we do continue to focus on good practice um, because, and I unfortunately jumped across this, but historically in the United States, uh, there was a widespread practice of cooperative education. There was federal funding in place, but unfortunately the quality wasn't quite there. It's, and, and eventually the federal government withdrew the funding for cooperative education because they were concerned about the lack of quality. And it's important for us that we have good quality practice, but we also evidence the quality practice. We need to be able to provide proof for this. Certainly, the expanding of more non-placement work and integrated learning is of the benefit. It gives more diversity across the university. It also means if we have another pandemic, we have already models in place that we can lever off. Not that we hope to have another pandemic, of course. Entrepreneurships, enterprises, startups, uh, universities need to be active in this. This is a, a, an important model within work integrated learning. And it's important to develop good exa local examples or good practice that, that reflects the context and the cultural context within that particular area. Um, uh, I would highly encourage everyone to connect with the international work integrated learning community. Uh, ASSET, I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, WACE is the International Body for Work Integrated Learning. They've got some great resources. And the nice thing about, about the WACE environment is that everyone is very much about sharing and caring. We, we don't mind that people are in different universities or even competing universities. It's just a really good, I, I describe it as a, as a professional family. It's just a nice space to be in. Uh, CWIL is the Canadian Association and ASIN is the Australian Association. Both have really good resources online, and I encourage you to go and visit their websites and plunder the good material and, and share that around. It's, it's freely available, and they're all sharing it for a reason. Uh, CEIA, um, that's the US Society, uh, they have some very good resources around practitioners. Uh, and Will and Z, that's, that's us here in New Zealand, we're still working on making resources available, but we will do in the next while. Now, the defining element of higher education is that it is a research-informed education. But you don't have to be a researcher to have research-informed education, but you do need to be a consumer of research. So I really encourage you to read 
widely uh, around the will research. I will skim across this one. Uh, there's some of the good resources. I've already mentioned the handbook uh, a number of times. It, it is a really good resource. It's just a really go to first book, and you'll find much of what you need uh, around that. We look at the theories, look at defining, we look at the benefits. We were very keen on having evidences around the benefits for each of the stakeholders. Uh, 11 different models of work integrated learning are described and explored. And we know that developing and managing work integrated learning is difficult. So we've got a whole section dedicated to that. And then we've got a section on dedicated to topical issues. And these are the meaty topics like well-being and equity and inclusion. Uh, I do keep an eye on the Rutledge website. Um, they, they run some good specials. Um, so if it's not on special, we'll come back a couple of weeks later. It quite likely will be. And the International Journal for Work Integrated Learning, it's open access. It's been around for 24 years. It's got many publications within it. Uh, it's double blind reviewed. We've got a very international uh, review board. Um, we've got special issues that we've been running. We had one on assessment, employability, of course, uh, research methods, uh, the impact on COVID of COVID. That ended up being a double special issue. We had so much interest. Uh, cultural perspectives, and I've mentioned the equity and, and well-being. It's, it's a really good um, journal to be accessing. If you go to the website on the top right, there is a button that says get notifications. So whenever we publish an issue, we'll flick out an email and you'll be notified that it is available. Uh, you won't be able to read this. That's OK. You can get it from the slides later on. But here's a list of books and good practice reports. Uh, some really good, good resources sitting in there. And you would have noticed that I've done a number of citations within the slides. Uh, this is the reference list here. Um, go through it later on and pick out the, the reading from that. Uh, there's some great bedtime reading sitting in here, so I really hope this will be a, a helpful resource. So with this, thank you for the opportunity to be able to present um, about working at Great Learning. For those who are active in that space, I want to encourage you, it's just a really exciting space to be part of. Uh, every time when students go on workplace or engage in non-placement work at Great Learning, they find it one of the highlights of this of their studies. Uh, and whenever they engage it, you, you see them changing and transforming. And, 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 and yeah, it's just a really exciting area to be in. So, uh, so be encouraged. Uh, so with that, I'll, um, I'll open up for questions.